Coming up on global business, Chinese President Xi Jinping presided over a top-level meeting which took stock of the current economic situation and identified the economic agenda for the second half of this year. China's top economic planner released detailed measures on Monday to boost investment in private sector, close on heels of the guidelines issued last week to support the private economy. Senior Chinese diplomat Wang Yi attends the BRICS security meeting in Johannesburg after visits to Ethiopia and Kenya. We check out what to expect. From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is Global Business. I'm Lili Lu. Senior party leaders held a meeting on Monday to analyze the economic situation and set out the economic work for the second half of the year. The meeting was presided over by General Secretary Xi Jinping. CGTN's Zhu Luoman has the story. The Politburo said the national economy has continued to recover and laid a good foundation towards achieving the annual economic and social development goals. Members emphasized the need to establish a new development pattern, comprehensively deepen reform and opening up, and continue to strengthen macroeconomic policies and expand domestic demand. Technological innovation, furthering the development of small and medium-sized enterprises, and stabilizing the exchange rate was also highlighted during the meeting. They discussed matters relating to expanding domestic demand through income increase and stimulating consumption in various sectors, such as automobiles, electronics, household goods, sports, culture, and tourism. As for foreign trade and investment, several measures were put forward, such as increasing international flights and ensuring the stable operation of China-Europe freight trains. Participants of the meeting also stressed the need to support the integration of digital economy and manufacturing, as well as the importance of the safe development of artificial intelligence. They called on free trade zones and ports to follow international high standard economic and trade rules. They also stressed the importance of the third Belt and Road Initiative International Cooperation Summit Forum, which will take place in China later this year. Zhu Luoman, CGTN. In the meantime, the CPC's Central Committee has held a symposium with non-party persons to discuss the economic situation and plans for the second half of the year. General Secretary Xi Jinping chaired the meeting. She called for macroeconomic policy adjustments and measures to expand domestic demand. He urged confidence in development, managing risks and boosting the economy. He also called for consensus building between the Communist Party and non-party members. Representatives from non-communist parties and organizations expressed agreement with the Central Committee's economic analysis and plans, and they provided advice on topics including opening up, internet regulation, artificial intelligence innovation. For more discussions on the economic challenges faced by China, we are now joined by Ying Xiaopeng, Dean of the Research Institute for Global Value Chains at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. Mr. Ying, great to have you on the show. First of all, what were the opinions expressed during the meeting today regarding the primary economic challenges that's faced by China currently? Uh, hi. Uh, well, it's a very good meeting. I think the, the judgment to current China is uh, uh, challenges very accurate. As major lady mentioned that uh, like four different uh, challenges. I think the major thing is to talk about the domestic uh, the domestic demand, which is not enough. And also they do have a uh, uh, problem for the firms, the operation, which is diffi difficult. And also they mentioned like uh, main and important uh, field, especially for the industry and the find a lot of challenge and the outside the, uh, you know, Climate environment seems quite uh, challenging and complex. Yeah, that's major things they conclude uh, for current challenge facing by China. I think they're quite accurate and uh, seems uh, precisely. Yeah, thank you. And also, in what ways can fiscal and monetary policies assist in supporting technology innovation in enterprises? Well, it's a uh, China is a situation different with the uh, United States and other countries. So sort of like the current policy I actually quite accurate. And the physical policy they call it a positive positive physical policy, which means they will reduce tax and other fees and probably will be increasing the public demand, sort of like a government that provides some more demand for society, uh, for infrastructure and something else. And also they have the they, they told they will hold a standard monetary policy 
uh, which is not uh, means they were increasing the interest rate as same as uh, like the United States and other industry countries. So China still uh, keep the lower interest rate, which is want to boost the economy and give the very strong support for the, the enterprises and also tech, uh, technology uh, innovators, uh, which need is uh, lower interest to boost the economy. Yeah, so that's very good uh, policy mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. And also, Thank we you. know that the meeting uh, mentioned about boosting domestic demand. How can boosting demand be harmonized with the reform of the supply side? Oh, yeah, uh, I think the, basically this kind of like uh, uh, market structure readjustment. And the supply side reform, normally we focus on like oversupply for certain industry which is coming from the uh, wrong market signal or wrong behavior by some local government. And so they supply more for in that, uh, some industry which is, didn't have enough demand for society. But right now, the China want to expand the demand, sort of like they want to focus on some industry which is, do need have lots of demand or potential demand. And this kind of co cooperation is sort of like uh, the, uh, well, use the macro economic policy to adjust, like uh, structurally reform with uh, the uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insights, Mr. Ying Xiaopeng, Dean of the Research Institute for Global Value Chains, the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. China's top economic planner released detailed measures on Monday to boost investment in the private sector, and this comes after China issued guidelines to support the private economy last week. Gao Wang reports. Clarifying key sectors, improving the guarantee mechanism, and creating a good environment for investment in the private sector. These are among the key messages from China's top economic planner while elaborating on the latest support for private investment. The key areas of encouraging and guiding private investment this time include transportation, water conservancy, clean energy, new infrastructure, advanced manufacturing, as well as modern facility agriculture. Some other key areas will also be the focus of our policy for the next step. The new measures include establishing a national key private investment project database, recommending those in the database to relevant financial institutions and encouraging them to provide financing. Officials say private investment is a key part of the private economy and will play a critical role in boosting investment growth, creating job opportunities and optimizing economic structure. The private investment mechanism is flexible, close to the market, and has a strong ability to absorb employment. For example, the proportion of private investment in manufacturing investment has always succeeded 70%, playing a key role in enhancing the international competitiveness of manufacturing, developing the real economy, and creating employment opportunities. These measures come after China issued guidelines to increase support for private economy last week. That includes improving the business environment, increasing policy support, and strengthening legal guarantees for private economy. Despite challenges such as insufficient demand, lack of confidence, and difficulty in financing, officials say they are promising opportunities for private investment in sectors such as manufacturing, especially clean energy and electric cars. They say they are also committed to offering more policy support to boost these prospects. Gao Wang, CGTN, Beijing. Well, the guidelines issued last week by the central government on supporting the development of the private companies received positive feedbacks from China's top entrepreneurs. Shanghai-based low-cost carrier Spring Airlines says the document fosters confidence in expanding overseas businesses. I'm very touched by guidelines regarding financing, fair competition and market access. The 18th article of the document says the government encourages private companies to expand overseas and supports them in tackling long-arm jurisdiction. I think it will be useful for us in launching more international routes. We are pondering new routes to countries along the Belt and Road Initiative. For example, Kazakhstan is open to Chinese visitors visa-free. We are already researching market conditions, including population, visa process, tourism facilities, and attractions. You're watching Global Business on CGTN. Still come on the program. 
Senior Chinese diplomat Wang Yi attends the BRICS security meeting in Johannesburg after visits to Ethiopia and Kenya. Check out what to expect. From the 1,035-kilometer railway linking China to Laos, facilitating connectivity and boosting economic growth in the landlocked Southeast Asian country. To the joint China-Saudi Arabia photovoltaic project to harness renewable energy in the oil-dependent kingdom. The Belt and Road Initiative has come a long way since it was first proposed in 2013, complementing the development strategies of partner countries and building on their existing strength. The Belt and Road Initiative, linking the world in the pursuit of common prosperity for humanity. Senior Chinese diplomat Wang Yi attends the 13th meeting of BRICS national security advisors and high representatives on national security in Johannesburg, South Africa, on Monday. The primary objective of this gathering is to meticulously prepare for the upcoming BRICS summit scheduled for August this year. The Chinese Foreign Ministry has expressed eagerness to engage in profound and extensive exchanges of views with BRICS partners on the current international security situation and issues of mutual interest during this visit. While Wang Yi's trip is geared towards forging consensus and fostering deeper cooperation, thereby infusing positive energy into a world undergoing turbulent and transformative times. For more on this, our reporter Sumitra Naidu joins us from Johannesburg. Take it away, Sumitra. Good afternoon. Sumitra Naidu, our correspondent is in uh, Johannesburg. Seems like we may have a bit of technic glitch. We'll see if we can reach out to her again later on down the show. But first of all, let's check out some latest numbers. Data shows that multilateral trade within the BRICS community is a supportive factor amid global trade recovery. And for example, in the first half of this year, China's trade with other BRICS countries when measured in dollar terms has been doing better than the overall picture. That is according to the country's customs office. Trade between China and Russia saw the largest jump, up over 40 percent. Trade with India fell slightly, but we have to take into consideration the strong base from last year when it surged 16 percent. Now China hopes to extend this positive effect to Turkey, Kenya, Ethiopia via diplomat, uh, diplomat Wang Yi's trip. And the BRICS Youth Summit leaders are calling for young people across the world to be active participants in the Just Energy Transition efforts. This is part of a draft declaration signed by the young leaders to ensure full, full participation of the youth in BRICS decision-making process. Yulisa Niamela has more. The young leaders spent a number of days at this summit deliberating on issues affecting young people in the five BRICS member states. Some leaders encouraged these attendees to fully participate in BRICS discussions, deliberations and decisions. Young people must seize this occasion and this moment before yourself. The significance of BRICS transcend individual countries and extends beyond the global south. Together, our young people today can play a more pivotal role in shaping the discourse of international affairs, advocating for a more equitable and just world order. In the rapidly shifting geopolitical landscape, BRICS is emerging as an influential bloc poised to reshape our international political economy. Among the many factors contributing to this rise should be the significant role played by the youth. I'm certain that this summit had occasion to explore what are the challenges and opportunity that could potentially frustrate and increase the voice of the youth, or rather the voice of the youth discourse about how to shape youth development policy in light of the continuously shifting 
global geopolitics. At the conclusion of the summit, the young leaders signed a draft declaration that will be presented to the youth ministers' meeting for decision making and adoption of the presentations and resolutions made by the delegates. We believe the BRICS countries should use their collective strengths to prioritize the development paradigm, using it as a guiding principle for our work as we continue intra-BRICS cooperation across areas such as youth development, trade, education, entrepreneurship, climate change, skills development and training, economic participation and transformation, health and well-being, social cohesion, and explore the establishment of the BRICS Youth Council, amongst many others. The declaration also includes the demand for developing a partnership towards an equitable just energy transition and strengthening of the meaning of participation in women peace processes. A number of other side events are due to take place in the run-up to the BRICS Summit that will be held in Johannesburg next month. Yuli Sanjamela for CGTN in Durban, South Africa. Now let's try again to reach out to our correspondent Sumitra Naidu in Johannesburg. Hi there, Sumitra, are you with us this time? Yes, I can hear you. Please tell us what to expect from the, from the meetings. Well, uh, of course, uh, you know, Wang Yi, one of China's most senior diplomats, he arrived in Africa this past weekend. He's already met with leaders in Ethiopia and Kenya. He arrived in South Africa last night to attend the 13th meeting of the BRICS National Security Advisors. This is an annual meeting usually held ahead of the BRICS Summit. It will uh, form part of the preparations for the upcoming Heads of State and Government Summit that will take place here in Johannesburg on the 22nd of August. Now, the various BRICS groupings have been meeting since January ahead of this main summit, focusing on economic cooperation, political dialogue, employment and labor issues, as well as sustainable development. At this meeting, national security advisors are expected to deliberate on how BRICS member countries can effectively address traditional and non-traditional security threats in a coordinated manner, enhance security, solidarity and coordinate development for its member countries and beyond. Beyond. Now, this is going to be one of the largest BRICS summits to be held. South Africa has invited over 60 heads of state from the Global South uh, to uh, attend this year's BRICS summit. All 54 heads of state from Africa have been invited. Now, there's been growing interest in the BRICS grouping with over 20 countries from South America to the Middle East applying to become members of this grouping. Obviously, the meeting that takes place, the security meeting, is uh, currently underway. It will go on for the next two days. We're not getting too much information. Of course, very sensitive matters to be discussed there. We probably will get more information, uh, you know, by later today or tomorrow. Great insights. Thank you very much. That's our correspondent, correspondent Sumitra and I do in Johannesburg for us. And still to come here on Global Business, Southeast Asian nations are looking to attract more Chinese visitors as the present number of incoming travelers is falling short of their expectations. And we find out why. We are all connected. Across borders. Across continents. Connected by ideas a shared humanity. Stay connected. In 2019, 150 million Chinese people traveled abroad, spending over 250 billion US dollars. That stopped with the pandemic. So when China reopened its borders at the beginning of this year, Southeast Asia was counting on Chinese travelers to help their economies recover. But the inflow is far from the surge that was hoped for. City Tian's Mira Lu reports. Before the pandemic, Chinese travelers were a powerhouse, a key driver of global tourism. For Singapore, China was the top source of tourists. 3.6 million, or about one-fifth of arrivals in 2019, were Chinese. 
The Singapore Tourism Board expected to see 30 to 60 percent of those numbers this year. But arrivals from China crawled back to 23 percent of pre-COVID levels in the first half of 2023. Every destination is, is screaming for tourists and giving discounts and, and making it much more affordable. So from that perspective, I think the more aspirational, the more dreamlike destinations will be more appealing. And probably people want to take off their bucket list and let's go there first. And Southeast Asia probably is very accessible. Hence, they'll say, we'll put it off. Another key reason is the slow resumption of flights, resulting in a substantial increase in airfares. As of mid-June, there were 425 weekly flights between China and Singapore. That's just a little over half of pre-COVID levels. Furthermore, Singapore's high cost of living has made it an expensive destination to visit. Attractions went up, hotels rates are much higher than before, transportation as well. So um, overall package now to Singapore is maybe easily 50% more expensive than pre-pandemic. Both Kevin and Jeremy further point out that the fundamentals of traveller behaviour have also evolved. Rather than a mixed group in a tour group of people who don't know each other, you'll find that the trend of having smaller groups but everyone knowing each other, um, more intimate. Let's say if there's 10 different groups of tourists into this context, the itinerary, there could be 10 variations. So it's not like a fixed package, we sell it and then everyone just sign up and come to Singapore. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of customization is involved. While the tourism industry accepts that there may not be a surge in the coming months, most remain optimistic that there will be a gradual return of Chinese tourists in one way or another. Large groups of Chinese tourists crowding destinations like the Merlion behind me may be a thing of the past. Post-pandemic, travelers are looking for more personalized, bespoke experiences within their budget. Singapore, together with its Southeast Asian neighbors, must find its niche and provide unique offerings to remain attractive as a repeat destination. Meirulu, CGTN, Singapore. China will resume its 15-day visa-free entry policy for citizens of Singapore and Brunei from Wednesday, and that is according to the Chinese embassies in the two countries. The visa-free entry to China will apply to ordinary passport holders in Singapore and Brunei who are traveling for business, sightseeing, visiting relatives and friends, and in transit. The policy was suspended for three years due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And a quick look at some other business headlines that we're tracking at the hour. A downturn in Eurozone business activity deepened much more than expected in July. HSOB's flash composite PMI for the block dropped to an eight-month low of 48.9 in July. That is from June 49.9, and that is as demand in the services industry declined while factory output fell. Japan's inflation will likely slow to around 1.5% next year when stripping away the effect of one-off factors, and that is according to the government, which has also called on central bank to work towards achieving its 2% inflation target. And Australia Treasurer Jim Chalmers said on Monday that the country's first budget surplus in 15 years would be even larger than first forecast. The number for the past financial year was likely to pass $14 billion, well up from the $2.8 billion projected in May. And this year's FIFA Women's World Cup has been breaking records for attendance in Australia and New Zealand and it is providing a welcome boost to their economies. Greg Navarro has more from Perth. I'm here in the western Australia city of Perth. This is one of five Australian cities that will be hosting 35 of the tournament's 64 games. Now, 1.4 million tickets have been sold here. That's more than the last FIFA Women's World Cup. And that's welcome news for the host nations expecting to generate nearly $600 million for Australia alone. Now, geography is playing a big role in that economic boost for hotels and restaurants here. Around 55,000 international visitors are projected to come here over the tournament, mainly from the US, the UK, and Europe. And while those visitors may attend only a couple of matches, because of the distance it takes to come to this part of the world, officials are expecting a lot of those visitors to turn their trips into an extended holiday, and use the extra time to see other parts of the country as well. And there is also a domestic tourism side to this, where people in Australia are taking advantage of the rare opportunity to see Women's World Cup games in their own country and traveling domestically to do so. And unlike other international sporting events, including the Olympics, 
This tournament doesn't involve a great deal of building infrastructure. In fact, all of the games that are being played in this particular Women's World Cup are taking place in existing stadiums, adding value to hosting an event like this. Greg Navarro, CGTN, Perth. Climate change is threatening the future of global rice production. Warmer temperatures and rising seas are cutting rice harvest yields. Scientists from the International Rice Institute in the Philippines are breeding rice varieties that can survive climate change. Gretchen Malalat reports. Rice is a food staple for over 4 billion people across the globe. But the future of global rice supply hangs in the balance. Extreme heat and drought produces rice harvest yields. Rising seas inundate low-lying rice fields with salt water. Extreme rainfall destroy hectares of paddy fields. Many farmers are also shifting to other agricultural crops to survive and make a living. Dr. Jahar Ali is the head of the Hybrid Rice Technology at the International Rice Research Institute, or IRRI. He says in the next decade, the effects of climate change will get worse and it could threaten global food security. Rice is in a different kind of challenge here. And we have to produce more food uh, with the limitation of time, uh, the, uh, the imports, uh, and all sorts of challenges that is emerging with the climate change and other things. So in that perspective, to put the food on the table in the next decade would be the biggest challenge that the scientists will face. Scientists at the Rice Institute have been developing rice seedlings that can survive extreme changes in climate. This rainout shelter mimics drought conditions. This is where they experiment different kinds of rice seedlings that can still thrive with less water. There are also paddy fields where they inundate with water to test seed varieties that can endure and recover from flooding. They are also at the forefront of cutting-edge rice farming innovations. I'm here inside the International Rice Gene Bank, which is the largest repository of rice seeds in the world. There are around 132,000 sample sets here. The temperature is around 2 degrees Celsius, which helped preserve the seeds to last up to 40 years. This is also where scientists select the genetic traits of seeds used to breed varieties that can survive unforeseen climate shocks. Dr. Ali has worked and learned from Chinese agronomist Yuan Longping, who is the father of hybrid rice. He says the fundamental of Longping's two-line hybrid rice technology has been the basis for most of their research. Dr. Ali is leading the Green Super Rice Project at the Rice Institute. They have successfully developed 35 hybrid rice varieties that are resistant to extreme climate shifts. 26 varieties are now being used in farms across the Philippines. If you put your rice in the uh, shortest duration and highest yield, that means you are putting your plant 110 days, less than 110 days, it should mature and yield. And at the same time, uh, the, the water required would become reduced, the land utilization will be less, and yield should be higher than. Traditional rice cultivation methods contribute around 10% of man-made methane emissions globally. The Rice Institute is now developing rice varieties and innovative methods that could help lower greenhouse emissions. Gretchen Malala, CGTN, Laguna Province. And with that, I'm closing out this edition of Global Business here on CGTN. Thanks for being with us. I'm Lily Liu in Beijing. See you next time. This is C.